Yo, it's Simba, and the Black Panther video is taking longer than expected. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten. It's gonna come out eventually, but I'm gonna do like quick rant dash stream of consciousness style videos before that. So let me know how you feel about this in the comments. Anyway, it's no secret that whether it's BreadTube or the DSA or whatever, uh, there's a whole lot of white dudes who call themselves Marxists who have a whole lot of opinions and they don't hesitate to tell you what they are, whether or not you ask. That combined with the fact that Marx himself is uh, another bearded old white dude can make Marxism feel like it's not really worth engaging with for a whole lot of people. While I definitely understand why a whole lot of folks haven't gotten around to it, I definitely think that there is a whole lot to gain for people who are not white and not men from engaging with and learning about uh, Marxism, and I hope by the end of this you'll agree with me. Before I go off about this though, I should probably give you a definition. Put simply, Marxism is a materialist criticism of capitalism that focuses on the types of people the capitalism creates, their relationships to one another, and tries to understand the patterns that those relationships leave on history. A whole lot of the time, uh, black and brown folks are already acutely aware of the patterns of exploitation that capitalism leave behind because of how badly we've suffered from them. Mass incarceration is today's slavery. It seems like every decade the U.S. government finds two or three Latin American countries to harass. And both the U.S. and Canada refuse to respect the treaties that they signed or, you know, the sovereignty of any indigenous nation practically. I'll leave it up to you to decide what to think of a government that can't stop doing war, genocide, or slavery after 400 years and every opportunity to do so. To put it bluntly, Folks of color have the most reason to criticize capitalism because we have the least stake in it. So what kind of relationships am I talking about? What kind of material? Marxism can't tell me why I didn't fit in in Catholic school and it can't tell me what kind of material to make pottery with. It puts economic material and economic relationships first. Marxists largely believe that you're one of two things. You're a worker or you're an owner. Owners pay workers the smallest amount possible to increase the value of the stuff that they own, while workers increase the value. It sounds like a bad deal, I know. Really bad Marxists reduce everything to that binary value, that worker-owner relationship. But really good Marxists understand that while that relationship is at the base of society, there's a whole lot of social factors that go into like what's happening on top of that. So these really good Marxists often ask really good questions that deal with both social and economic factors, like, why does gentrification happen so often in black neighborhoods? And how does that relate to previous forms of exploitation? How does US foreign policy in Latin America affect uh, migration across the Southern border? And why is the media so ready to perpetuate racist ideas about that? Do we really live in a society? Like, I, I get it, I know, but like, like, do we really? Marxism is also really good at breaking past a whole lot of myths that we have about relationships in society and lays bare any actual antagonisms that might be there despite what folks might tell you, like Huey Newton does in this upcoming clip. In America, uh, black people are uh, treated very much as uh, the Vietnamese people or any other colonized people because we're used, we're brutalized, the police in our community occupy uh, our uh, area, our community as a foreign troop occupies territory, and the police are there not to, uh, in our community, not to uh, promote our welfare or uh, for our security and our safety, but they're there to contain us, uh, to uh, brutalize us and murder us, uh, because they have their orders uh, to do so. And um, just as the soldiers in Vietnam have their orders to uh, destroy the Vietnamese people, uh, the, the uh, police in our community couldn't possibly be there uh, to uh, protect our property because we own no property. Uh, they uh, couldn't possibly be there to see that uh, we receive the due process of law for the simple reason that uh, the police themselves deny us the due process of law. And so it's very apparent that the police are only in our community, uh, not for our security, but the security of the uh, business owners in the community, and also to see that uh, the status quo is kept intact. But Karl Marx was not 100% right about everything. He was writing from his time from Europe. He couldn't have accurately observed and recorded or even predicted every single kind of social relationship or social phenomenon that could happen because of capitalism. Lucky for us though, there's about 140 years of Marxism after Marx 
and taking on capitalism isn't one man's job, so there are plenty of other thinkers that we can go to uh, to try and understand capitalism, and that's where people of color and people who are not men uh, are very, very important. For example, Franz Fanon, who wrote that book right there, said that Marxist analysis should always be slightly stretched when you're dealing with the colonial question. Karl Marx had never even been to a colonized country, so he couldn't possibly have a first-hand perspective on that topic, so he didn't have much productive to say. Worse yet, settler leftists, Marxists, anarchists, the whole nine, often have a whole lot more at stake in the status quo than they realize, leading them this much closer to reactionary kind of thinking. On the other hand, Franz Fanon himself was a colonized person who took part in decolonization struggles. He had that first-hand experience and got to know the people so well that he did a whole ass book right there about the psychological makeup of the colonized and the colonizers. My country of heritage, Zimbabwe, had its own Marxist revolution, at least in name, to kick out the British, and they have a completely different perspective on what Marxism is compared to those of us in the West. For any Europeans watching this, instead of hitting like and subscribe, you could just like relieve those sanctions, that'd be cool. Last major point I wanna get across is that, especially on the internet, uh, little misinterpretations and little differences between people explode into like cataclysmic drama. I played that up for the camera, but like it, it's not new. Everybody knows it. But at least Marxism offers that maybe one day, two if we try hard enough, uh, we might have some meaningful idea of working class unity. Where working class people of all shapes and sizes who are class conscious, which is aware of their place in the class struggle against the few rich assholes, take capitalism to its natural conclusion, which is socialism. In the description below, there's gonna be a whole list of book recommendations written by people of color who were at least inspired by Marx, whether or not they call themselves Marxists. On Monday, April 13th at 5.30 p.m., uh, I'm gonna be joined by a whole host of folks and we're gonna go over Jay Sakai's book, Settlers, uh, chapter one. And hopefully we'll make it through the whole thing. That's just gonna be the first part and I hope that you join me for that. Until then, uh, I'm gonna let Kwame Chure finish it up. Hit like if you'd like, click subscribe to join the pride, ding that bell, and I wish you well. They confuse people about socialism. Brother, the other day said, well, I ain't no socialist. I said, why not, brother? He said, cause it's a white thing. I said, oh, really? You see, Europe tries to make believe that everything that comes out of the world comes out of Europe. I told the man, I said, socialism ain't no white thing. He said, yes, it is. He said, Karl Marx discovered it. I told him, Karl Marx never discovered socialism. He cannot. You call the laws of gravity Newton's laws. <laughs> but you certainly cannot believe that Isaac Newton can found that a body falls at the rate of 32 feet per second squared per second squared. He can't find this. He can't discover it. He cannot invent this. He can only observe it and record it, discover the law. If I'm sitting in Timbuktu in Africa, and I've never heard of Sir Isaac Newton, and I'm conducting any experiments with gravity, I will come to the same conclusion that he does. A body in motion tends to stay in motion unless stopped by an outside force. He cannot invent this. He can only observe it and record it. Now, Marx did not invent socialism. If I'm sitting in Libya, in the desert, and I'm doing any research with capital labor without ever having heard of Karl Marx, I will come to the same conclusion that he did, that any time capital seeks to dominate labor, there'll be a ruthless, uncompromising struggle on the part of labor until it comes to crush capital and dominate it. This is a fact. My history demonstrates that. We came here as chattel slaves for centuries. We fought and fought and fought until we crushed it. Now we're just slave of the wage, and now we've got to rise up and crush that one. That's to declare that Karl Marx didn't invent socialism, it's there for all to see. Karl Marx's great contribution to the world was in the area of historical materialism and dialectical materialism, something you need to know if you know about socialism. But since you don't know about socialism, you don't even know the words. And not only does the enemy keep you ignorant, you stay ignorant. You won't ever go read a book about socialism. Why read a book about socialism? They already told me in my class it ain't no good.